So you have been presenting Theory U for many years now, and surely the way that you described it has evolved over the time. How would you describe Theory U today? Thank you for, uh, for the invitation and um, uh, for, for being part of this conversation. And I mentioned yesterday when we had a little uh, pre-convo that uh, the, the main reason why I um, uh, agreed for the session is uh, I wanted to learn, right? So, so I, I am uh, uh, very interested, I think, and sympathetic with uh, the, the principles of uh, so. So, sociocracy and um, uh, but um, uh, I, I'm mainly ignorant right of, of the specifics right not really of the, the core principles um, but really I, I want to more learn kind of from you who have been pushing this forward and implementing it and learning from the experience so so that's really what brings me to the into the conversation, mainly ignorance and curiosity. Um, and uh, in terms of your um, your question, um, I would say um, theory U is, is essentially an example of awareness-based systems change. And the way I would um, summarize awareness-based systems change is with the uh, uh, three following principles. One, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness. And um, that's probably many of us have experienced, right? Kind of, uh, unless we change, change the mindsets of people who are enacting systems, nothing really changes, fundamental really changes. And two, of course, then is about how you do that. So you cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see, sense, and invert itself. That's the second learning. See itself is obvious, right? That's kind of classical systems thinking. You need to look into the mirror. And, and often in social entities, this mirror is missing. So that's really where we need methods and tools. But what we learned is seeing yourself is not enough because if I just know everything about what's broken with the system, what's broken with you, basically, that doesn't, that's not healing in any kind of social situation, right? Because unless I feel the pain of those on the receiving end, say of structural violence and exclusion, um, I'm very, unlikely to actually do anything uh, substantial about it. So that's the sensing, right? That's the heart dimension, essentially. And then invert itself really is about uh, consciousness. It's kind of a shift of consciousness. It's kind of the insight that the issues outside are a mirror of the issues inside and that there is an interdependency and that to, sh to create a profound shift outside of us in these patterns we need to first create a profound shift within ourselves so those are um, these uh, three make uh, you cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see sense and invert itself and then the last one is you cannot lead systems transformation unless you sense and embody the future so unless you sense and actualize the future would be another way of saying the same thing or uh, a third way is unless you sense and step into the future so if you double click on the word leadership it literally means to step forth to move from one territory that we know very well current reality into another one that is basically uncharted territory, particularly if we face moments of disruption. And that is only coming into being if we have the courage to step into the into that territory of the unknown. And that's very much, I think, the, the first person experience of, uh, of leadership today. And that's what I'm interested in exploring. And that's what uh, Theory U is exploring because it deals with this um, uh, edge between the current and that what is wanting to emerge. 
through us. Yeah, thank you, Otto. It's I'm just noticing as I'm hearing it again after a while that I was I, I did um, theory you a few few years ago and listening again how already from the listening there's another another part something new that's coming up um, as I hear you speak. Um, thank you. So Ted, a similar question for you, really. Um, so theocracy has also been around for for quite a while, and so far I think it's been around for about five years or so. Um, how it how did how do you see so theocracy has been evolved in the in the recent years, and where is it heading? Hello. Yes. Um... So a quick summary of sociocracy, because I assume that some people might be here who don't know, and I assume many people here do know. So I see sociocracy really as a system to intentionally distribute power in an organization. And there are different strategies to do that, like having small teams called circles, empowered to make decisions in a very defined domain. And we do that so we can keep groups small and really allow for listening and deliberation within those teams and, as I said, empower them to make decisions locally. And um, there are clear rules about how those domains are distributed and how they can be passed on so that we have a fractal nested system. For example, any circle can power can pass power to a subcircle within other people in it. And what that subcircle's domain is, is decided in mutual consent. Consent is that is one of those basic principles to make sure that everything is aligned, that we're not missing any crucial information. And that's also how small groups make decisions together. They set the 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 agreements or the um the policies, basic agreements to then create conditions where people can act autonomously and really choose um, who serves um, as what. Then there's a way of having meetings and rounds, all of it serving the um, the serving better listening between people and also a commitment to learning and improvement um, overall in all the aspects that's baked into sociocracy. Um, sociocracy is has been around since the 1980s or late 1970s, so it's been a while, uh, longer than about as long as I've been around um, on Earth, not in sociocracy. Um, and it's used now in business communities, nonprofits, grassroots groups um, all over. A strong and very experienced sector are intentional communities, but also tech. Um, and it's now coming really strongly in some other sectors like co-ops and other industries. And experiments in units of organizations. Um, sociocracy for all was founded really to give people access to sociocracy because it wasn't as easily accessible we found and to um, help people learn and train and, and um, implement as for the evolution of how has it changed i think i mean it has grown that's for sure um, and we've been trying to support in sociocracy for all just making sure it's easier to implement it's easier to find each other for example to learn with each other from each other from experiences already made and another piece and that's what leads us here today is that we've been working pretty hard also to see what the ecosystem is of sociocracy and what are some other modalities frameworks systems concepts whatever that dovetail or complement sociocracy and that's why we've been interested in uh, theory U as one of them um, to see just like in sociocracy we want several voices right so that we hear kind of more of reality than just one person but one person has access to and the same happens of course on a movement level sociocracy has blind spots and probably any other system as well that's a safe assumption so how can we bring all this together and and have a more coherent view of of what's happening yes thank you it feels like there's um the words that comes to me that connects both of your um of your sharing is around wholeness how do we bring all of ourselves into into the system into the organization both our mind our heart our body our spirit 
also talking about the evol evol evolutionary purpose and how we sort of sense and respond to the world as it happens rather than um, maybe force uh, more control uh, idea of how things should should go and should be um so yeah this is very inspiring for me to hear and maybe just before we go a little bit deeper Otto would you share with us some guidelines for the four levels of listening so we can use it and, and practice it as as, our, as we go deeper into our call today uh, well, I'm not sure about guidelines, but uh, a distinction, right? So I, I can um, uh, uh, um, maybe um, share just the distinction um, on uh, four different levels of listening, and that maybe then a tool kind of as you listen to this um, conversation where you can track your own uh, listening, which is actually then kind of the kind of lever meta level of awareness that awareness based systems change is uh, trying to cultivate and ground it in. Um, so uh, first level of listening is basically listening from what we already know, right? And by definition, nothing new comes into this skull here, right? So so it's like, it's uh, as if you're in a closed room, and um, all you perceive is basically based on what you already know, kind of the, your experiences uh, that you got, which is the experiences of the past. And it's basically as if you're in a closed room and you project uh, a movie to the screen. So uh, so what you see is what you project. Um, it, it, may, it may be appropriate to a situation mm -hmm. or not, uh, but it, it's you're not actually seeing what's going on outside. You're, you're projecting. You're limited by what you already know. And the result, the outcome of that one is uh, reconfirming what you know. And whenever you are sitting in a meeting where stuff uh, sort of uh, what happens, what you notice around you is reconfirming what you expected to see, then you are downloading. It's not good or bad. It's just one out of four. And um, if, if that's your only one and you live in a moment of disruption, maybe that's a uh, recipe recipe for for uh, trouble uh, so number two is um, noticing something new right noticing something unexpected so the outcome of that is disconfirming data so whenever you notice something that you didn't expect to see that's number two that's what we call factual listening and the gateway into that is really open your mind and leaning into um, what's unexpected, what you didn't expect to see. Uh, basically, it means leaning into disconfirming data, right? So something that's contradicting maybe your own opinions or expectations. That's the skill you want to train there, uh, leaning into disconfirming data. So how would you know whether or not uh, it's kind of do you pick up any anything new, kind of anything that's unexpected? Then you're on level two. Level three is when the place from where you're listening is happening is shifting. So, um, and that's what we call empathic listening, or most people call it actually. And um, it means that the place from where your listening is operating shifts from you listen from in here and you're out there and I notice kind of what, what, what uh, you try to bring across here towards listening from the place from where another person is trying to articulate something from. So that's kind of the empathic listening. You're tuning, it's, it's basically you're tuning into someone else's perspective. And whenever we follow someone else's story, we naturally do that as human beings, right? Whenever you have a deep conversation with a friend, kind of you're, you're na we naturally do that. And uh, the gateway, obviously, um, for activating that level of listening is here. It's the heart. So you need a really love another person right in order to open the heart as an organ of perception not as a place of emotions that's kind of re 
replaying the past, but really as an organ of perception to tune into someone else's um, experience. So that's um, so it's it's almost how would you know? Well, you forget your own agenda, you forget your own worrying, what do you want to say next and all of these things. And you just take a deep dive in someone else's uh, perspective. So that's uh, number three, um, forgetting about yourself, if you want, and, and really beginning to see the situation through someone else's eyes. And number four would be uh, if something new is being born, right? So where you uh, drop to a deeper level of perception uh, that is not just about the current experience, but where you attend to that what is, uh, you know, wanting to happen to, to a, a sense of possibility of something uh, maybe wanting to happen, wanting to manifest, but staying in need of you in order to manifest, right? So, so it's kind of, that's where you want to, something that's, um, uh, uh, that's possible, but not necessary. And the moment you, you attend to that and you help that to begin to manifest, that's kind of where you uh, drop into this um, deeper level that we call generative listening. And that almost always, uh, funny enough, is uh, when you move into that, it has to do with going to, um, uh, uh, through a moment of stillness, right? A stillness and of letting go, including letting go of your own expectation. And often also letting go of your own, what you thought needs to happen next, right? And really totally connecting to what's wanting to emerge in the current moment. Beautiful. Yes, thank you. So I would really invite all of us to just pay attention and just sort of play and just pay attention to those four levels of listening, uh, just as information for for oneself. Uh, and later in the conversation, later in the triad, we can have some space to share about that. And Pascal, would you could you share with us uh, some examples from uh, your practice? Um, Pascal works both with sociocracy and theory you. Uh, so maybe you can share some something around your practice that can highlight the way that the two technology may support or complement each other. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Edith. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm feeling very much joy here. I first need to share with that. Um, I'm feeling joy, not only because I'm with two of the people who have taught me so much in the recent years, but also because I love holding space for communities of practice to meet up and connect. So we want more of that and less of silos. I'm very happy that we are here. I want to offer a perspective on our topic that's nourished by my practice and by my research. I'm an avid action researcher and I love going from theory to practice and practice to theory. Uh, so to scaffold our reflection, I'll share examples and tell stories that uh, I have experienced either as a member and facilitator of collectives, but also as someone who works with uh, big institutions. And I want to share with you uh, three stories. And after that, I'll ask a question uh, for Otto and, and Ted that derive from these stories. And the first story I'm going to tell is one I think that we have uh, all heard of. It's a group of people they meet um, and they see that they have common values and they dream together, they feel really aligned and they start for this reason a collective because they've seen something emerge between them and they see a future together. But then um, as they start uh, collaborating, some people make decisions that others don't like and things go bad, the members end up uh, hating each other and splitting, the thing is over. I've seen, uh, unfortunately, this happen uh, three times in my life in three different collectives. Now I'm starting a new one and I really want to do things differently. And noticing the quality of our listening, as uh, Otto was saying, accessing deeper sources of knowing, um, uh, really depending on trust and love, empathic and generative listening, these are really uh, necessary ingredients for people to engage in meaningful collective uh, action. 
but it doesn't guarantee that equivalence and establishing a democratic ethos will be achieved in the group. So uh, the people who are most used to having power, for example, will tend to exercise their power more than those who are perhaps less fluent in using power. And this tells me actually that when a group bypasses the importance of power and power with, then it's the power over and the systemic oppressions that fast invites itself to the party. So in order to avoid reproducing patriarchal, uh, colonial and other power over structures and systemic oppression, we need both love, trust, connection for access to deeper sources of knowing and power regulation which is a true, achieved through governance. And I think this is an essential um, political dimension that needs to be added to the relational uh, dimension of change making. I'm gonna tell a second story. I have three stories and this one's very short. Um, I educate myself in lots of approaches because I am really into awareness-based practice and I like um, enriching my practice all the time with action research. I was at a training on uh, dragging and dreaming and it was a three day residential. Uh, the first day it was exactly what the you is. We were going down and presencing to each other, going through um, meeting our dragon and dreaming together. So there was a deep connection and a great process of emergence there that I really enjoyed. And then the next day it was time to go into planning, prototyping from, from that experience. And here we were just sent to groups, uh, groups of six, um, and told to make decisions together, but we were not really given any tools to make these decisions. And um, well, in our group, I immediately brought sociocratic um, ways of doing it, and we really enjoyed and managed to do, but I was observing other groups, and I was seeing how a few were taking too much space, and certainly, um, these things happen uh, because we have not yet unlearned the very competitive reflexes that we've been taught over the years. So um, I think this appears for me to be a blind spot of many awareness based frameworks, but the opposite blind spot also exists in governance frameworks. And this is where my third story comes in. Um, in sociocracy, as Ted was explaining, uh, we do rounds for giving voice to everyone in equivalence. And uh, members are speaking in turns, and there's a conversation going on in rounds. You get feedback and you access others' point of view, which is great. It helps to open the mind, which is something that is very relative to factual knowledge on the second level that Otto is uh, describing, especially when the people are bringing feedback from a deeper source than from their ego. So that's a very important thing that we might want to discuss a bit later. But sociocracy, in sociocracy, we tend to assume that because people are meeting in rounds, they're always listening to each other uh, with a fresh mind and an open heart. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. And um, sometimes in the rounds, um, it can happen that a member of the circle is being marginalized, for example. Or some members can get into downloading pack patterns, um, judgments about other members of the circle, especially when decisions are important and it gets tense. For example, Joe can think, oh, I really know what Char Shirley is going to say because she's so predictable. Or I have a feeling that I've made up my mind about Eric and I really think that Eric mostly, I don't understand what he says. I don't get it, what he's about. So I'm stuck. I'm stuck in this kind of pattern here where Shirley and Eric, Eric are seen in a certain way and I'm completely absenting. This has a very big impact on the way I will then pay attention to and the way I'm able to show up and engage in a collaboration and in dialogue. And in some, what I wanted to say with all these stories is that no method does it all and each framework, the two frameworks we're looking at here, which is sociocracy and theory, you give very different answers that go very well together to support agency and action. Uh, there's the head, the heart, the hands, and there's governance. There's both. That's why creating composite approaches, I think, uh, and practices is good. And we have a project about that. We might get to talk about it too. Um, and my question, I guess, uh, I want to give back to you, Otto and Ted. Um, why do such core skills and technologies exist separately if they're needed together? And could a sociocracy include systematic awareness practice? 
could theory U incorporate the governance dimension, especially on the right side of the U? These are my questions to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pascal. Anyone would like to go first? All right, Otto, why would why don't you start? <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, hap happy to. Um, so I think the um, the the first two example. I, I mean, the short answer is yes, right? So so can, should they be uh, composite? Yes, the answer is yes, and um, and I am like uh, I'm not just kind of, uh, and I think it, the the same is true for all of you, and and particularly for you, Ted. Um, I'm not just a, you know, a guy who puts out frameworks and tools and throws them onto people. I'm a, like a practitioner myself, right? And um, so I do pretty much what everyone else is doing who is a practitioner, which is you need to integrate all this stuff, right? Uh, into, uh, in order to be useful to a situation. So uh, I'm, um, and I think kind of one of the benefits of Theory U is that it's a, a meta framework, which allows you to hang in different things, uh, particularly kind of different, um, uh, which then allows you to, to integrate that in the uh, uh, in, in a in a framework, a meta framework of uh, awareness based um, social change. So that's. Um, so that's that's quite familiar. I mean, it's um, we all do that, right? And 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 I think we need better tools for that. That helps us also on the integration part, not just spelling out the differences. So I, I really uh, sympathize and support this this intention you're putting forth with your question. Um, uh, just maybe a, a two or three quick. Um, uh, 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 reactions to what you said. Uh, uh, I would say kind of the first case or the first two cases, kind of the, the dreaming and then the decision, the, sp the split, right? The collapse. So uh, personally, I don't really, uh, that's really not my experience. So, so I, I can't really talk that much from my experience to that type of story that, that you went through three times. Um, but what I would say uh, is, and it also is applicable to, to the second one, the dreaming and then the prototyping, uh, that's not what theory U is, right? You don't start with dreaming. You actually start with sensing. So, so basically everyone today talks about co-creativity and prototyping and so on. Now that also is a part in the theory you process, but it comes at the tail end almost, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff you does you're doing before, and so so that's just a, a, like a general methodological um, response to what you said. Often, when stuff is not working in the end, it is actually the wrong place to tinker with the end. The problem is actually right there at the beginning, how you start how you set the field and uh, how you jump over maybe processes. Now, I, so I'm like, um, um, I don't like to generalize there because I think there can be situations where you actually can start with dreaming, right? But when you deal with real situations, almost always you have some history, you have different views, you have people who are excluded and so on. To get your arms around that situation, you need a comprehensive sensing method first. And that is basically, so if you want an analogy, it's like kind of, uh, if, you, if you take the analogy of the violin, right? To listen to the violin, you, you need more than the strings. You, you need the body of resonance, right? In the social world, the body of resonance is not there because we are all operating in these silos. You need to establish that body of resonance through an intervention. That's what we call sensing and co-sensing. So I would basically 
a point towards the beginning, right? Kind of that's the place of intervention. And that's where often the highest leverage in any kind of social process is, is, is at the beginning, right? It's, it's the kind of social field that you invoke. And um, well, that's just a, a methodological um, a response to, uh, to the first one. Now, I want to uh, maybe also to lead into, I don't want to go on for too long, but but I want to, uh, so in, so can they, they be combined? So the short answer is yes. And the longer answer is, in theory, you, you have kind of this evolution of governance from the old structures that we have inherited from the past, kind of the visible hand the of, of hierarchy the invisible hand of the market and then kind of all the negotiated stakeholder groups and what theory you really suggest is that we need the birth of a fourth coordination mechanism right for the kind of governance structures that we need today that we call a uh, uh, collective action from shared awareness, CASA, or awareness-based collective action. But what it really means is that you, with a stakeholder group, create a shared container, or a shared body of understanding that is going through all these different systemic perspectives, that is deepening the understanding from what is to what is wanting to emerge and which is then exploring these possibilities by doing. That's basically what it is, awareness-based collective action. And that uh, is really my interest in uh, sociocracy, right? So because I think, of course, it is all the interventions. Uh, for example, we have been doing with the UN interventions over the in 26 countries with senior leadership over the past uh, three or so years. And, you know, the main issue is really kind of uh, the transformation of governance, right? To relocalize uh, governance, right? Could, to bring it back kind of to the, to, to the local level. And that, of course, uh, not only requires innovation in terms of outer governance, but also, uh, uh, you know, awareness-based technologies, kind of shared sense-making methods. And so that's, um, I believe, uh, where we hold kind of different, uh, different pieces. So, so here's kind of my, um, uh, my, uh, uh, my two questions that I would that I would also like to put forth into this conversation, um, and and I'm sure that there are good answers to that. So the first one is I studied actually at a university that was governed by uh, consent, by basically everyone meeting. Um, so all the decisions were made. Um, by everyone, uh, faculty, students, kind of administrators, meeting once a week, right, for a couple of hours or something, right, the General Assembly. And that worked well when we were small. And then as this thing was growing, and also other faculty were uh, joining, uh, at a certain point, uh, that basically fell apart. And it uh, allowed one or two people really to block the whole system to uh, to move forward. Um, so even though it wasn't really consensus, it was more consent, the intention kind of it, 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 it um, so that's where I learned if you have a flattening of the structure, but uh, you don't have this capacity to operate as a community from a shared intent, or that's only their performer, but not embodied, that can be a recipe for a lot of frustration. And then uh, mm -hmm. maybe more recently, so what, what, what I am noticing in our current situation where wherever you go, including with the organization that I am also in, in a leadership situation in, kind of the Crescensing Institute, um, everyone 
is facing disruption and needs to reimagine and reshape themselves. And when you do that with any organization, here's the funny thing that happens. Um, just about everyone is overvaluing current reality relative to the future. So because people often don't really sense or feel the how real the future is. And I think that's a real obstacle, right? So if you um, so the more you democratize decision making, the more kind of this is really, this can be a challenge that there is a bias in just about every organization, a strong bias that is overvaluing what is relative to what is wanting to emerge, to the emerging future. What do you do about that? And what's the implication of that for decision making when the challenges and what the future wants us to do is really reimagining, reimagining and reshaping? I think it's my turn, right? And now I have three things on my mind, and I hope I, I can hold them all, because I think it would make most sense to answer your first question first, Otto, your first question, then go to my answer to Pascal's question, and then come back to your second. So I'll try that. So the um, your example around how does consent or consensus doesn't really matter in this case so much. How much does that scale if you're too big for a general assembly to listen to each other? And that's, I think, where the distribution and the nesting and the fractal pattern comes in again, right? To really have a system where we always only have small groups, because I don't want everybody to decide on everything. I don't want to be in a system where that is the case. That's why it's distributed. So it's the combination of consent and distribution and that balance between what is decided in a fairly central circle and what is decided in decentralized circles. Uh, that balance is something we can be intentional about because sociocracy is kind of compatible with a lot there. Anyway, so that's just a short answer to that. Then the other one was, let's see, it was about um, why, oh, could it, could we blend? The bias. Yes. I mean, yeah. Hold on. The bias. Yes. The bias and the and the, could it could it blend? No. That I'm going to Pascal's question real quick. So here's how I'm looking at the whole blending thing. Um, for me, it's also yes. I think this can all blend. The one thing that I think I'm a little just cautious about, though I can't really put my finger on why I'm cautious about it, um, is the hope to kind of grow into like a super methodology you know that includes everything i think i'd like to have something that is a little bit more modular maybe it's just my my um discomfort with everything that's kind of a total overarching something so i think where, where i'm going with this is um a modular more pluralist approach where there's many different tools and we all understand when to use what that to me is the biggest thing when do you shift out of this and that mode and come to this and that mode? You know, when do you slow down? When do you say, whatever, we'll just try it out now? So how can groups have more literacy with the tools, all the different methodologies, and use them in the appropriate moments? And that's exciting to me because that's not as much a theoretical question. That's more a question of skills and how do you how do you get people ready for that? And um it also, I mean, there's things happening in two levels. Basically, there's the 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 tools themselves, you know, or whatever we call them, sociocracy theory, all the others, and then there's the people on the ground. And people on the ground have been meshing and dovetailing a lot, right? And I think we're lagging actually behind the practitioners who have already been combining things and understanding of like, right? How do you do that? Like, what do you combine? Explain that to me. 
like I see a bunch of parallels where I would like to sit down and really understand how could I change my teaching so that it's more compatible with what people hear when they've gone to the real trainings before. For like where I see the connection, how can I make that more obvious to people that some of the things we're actually talking about very, very related things. Now on the disruption question, that's, yes, everybody is facing disruption. We talked about that a little bit yesterday in our prep session, um, because whenever I think about that, there's a little bit of panic coming up in me because I'm so aware how disruption is just going to increase more and more. And when people are in full-blown existential crisis, I don't think it's the best moment to, to learn and shuffle your governance system because your governance system is your operating system right this is not something that you can just do real quick so what i do with that is that i just tell myself okay if we need to catch the people who are not in full um emergency mode and train them and get enough skills in before the door closes basically because i notice in times when people are very overwhelmed for example we notice that, or I'm telling myself at least, that we notice that in sociocracy for all, how the demand for sociocracy goes down as people are kind of more freaked out about whatever's happening in the world. So how can we, given the, the trajectory of what I project in the future, how can we get enough skills in so that people can manage and, and buffer what is what is coming? Um, I love the, the quote that, that you brought here or that um, people overvaluing um, reality relative to the future. And that's something I really want to kind of take home, although I am home, and uh, sit, with, sit with because it is true that if people are not allowing themselves to, to tune into that, that that will affect how conservative their decision making will be, right? So that is something that that is like sociocracy is a a somewhat agnostic method there because although we support experiments and so on, it still depends on people doing that experiment. It, there's nothing you can do to make them do it. They have to that has to come from them and their own freedom of. Um, yeah, allowing themselves the freedom to think about that. So that is clearly a case where sociocracy might fall short and where it would be good to combine with other tools. Check. Pascal, I wonder if there's something that you want to say to bring this to a close and we can then turn into some questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I I I like the perspectives that were offered after my uh, stories, and I would like to go back to something that Otto said that I find extremely important, and actually Ted was referring to it too, is this importance of local uh, groups and governance, local governance, but not only that, uh, our local communities, um, as as we're going to move forth, we're speaking about disruptions. I'm not sure if we're not already looking at elements of, of chaos beyond disruptions. Um, we're going to be doing daily negotiations in the next years to come, where if we talk about, for example, energetic sobriety, already this engages us in thinking, OK, so what are the choices we make? What do we have to give up? Uh, what are the principles that we're going to use to choose what we give up, what we we, we can do together? Um, how are we going to create comments? How are we going to make sure that locally there is generative uh, land use, etc.? For example, in our countries, there's a very small percentage of land that is in the commons. I think if we're going to find these solutions to the climate issue, it's, this is going to have to change, for example. So this very local aspect um, and communities needing the tools so that they can um, come into these negotiations with awareness and uh, with tools that allow them to to move forth and do the experimentations that they need to do to learn. Um, so that's what I, I was thinking. And I'll look into the uh, APCA. I think that's an interesting uh, aspect of theory that I, theory that I don't know very well. So I'll 
very happy to hear about that and I'll check into that. Can I can I make an, another uh, com comment on that? Because I, I think this is a really um, interesting exchange. So, so I would say, and uh, so, so the short answer is yes on the combination. And I think kind of, uh, it would be also interesting to specify maybe where there is a little bit of a difference. Uh, so I would say on theory use side of things, we definitely need a lot more specificity around the 4.0 governance, which is kind of around really awareness-based systems change. And that really brings me to this conversation because there's a lot to learn. Because in principle, I, I agree on, on the kind of uh, intuition that you all have in, in, in sociocracy uh, uh, towards uh, a more distributed governance and towards forms of governance that help us to really um, uh, to really come up with more intentional ways of, of governance. So where we clarify what the shared intention is for economic decisions and for all other decision making. I, so I, I am fully on the same page uh, there. I have, uh, you know, there are like two levels where I have questions, right, about the limitations. So there's the first one is, I think there is, so, uh, so you said, if I understand that right, kind of the circles and then the different layers and so on, that to me sounds slow, right? So, so that kind of all these feedback loops, and I know that from partners, right? So yeah, I need to go. So that slowness that comes with all these iterations can be an obstacle, right? When, when you need to act in an instant, right? So, so that's... Um, that's a little, and the other one is uh, because you need to, for decision making, you need kind of the rationale and so on. Um, there is a bias for what you can have a good rationale for versus an entrepreneur activity. All the best decisions I ever did were without rationale. So, because you need the future shows up not first here, it shows up in your heart first. And you can't even, so the best entrepreneurial decisions is where you do stuff without knowing um, why you do it. And that's, so the subtitle of my book, Theory U, was leading from the emerging future is not leading toward the emerging future because then you're driven by the past from the emerging future is really developing a sense making opening up your mind heart and will in a way that allows the future to use you as an instrument to operate through you so that's but the point is if you just stay so i think if if uh, if I would set up a way of where everything is uh, rational, you know, subject to a rational conversation where you need to convince others, by def I guarantee you that the decisions will be more driven by the past than by the future, because that's what the 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 rational mind is doing. But the, the, the trick about leading from the future is to move beyond the rational mind. And so that's kind of instinctively, when I look at these two things, the slowness with all the layers and so on. So I think what, we, what I see where we are moving into is collapse and chaos and breakdown. And how do we thrive in these situations? That's my question. And um, I think what we need is a fluid way of organizing, more a liquid way of organizing, to be familiar with these situations, to be a friend of disruption, to be adaptive and moving with these situations. And for that, we need to be, uh, I think, all these layers and all these feedback loops, that's not really working. So we need a, um, 
we need to move with the chaos, right? We, we need to uh, have much bigger formats. So for example, bring a lot more people together into collective bodies of sense making, out of which what we need to do is emerging by itself, not as kind of many loops of rational decision making, but it's kind of this collective way bodies of, of making sense of a situation than acting in an instant as a systems capacity. That's what I'm interested in. And that's where some of the specifics, even though I, I'm with you 100% on the philosophy, some of the specifics, I have my wonderings how, how practical that is in, in the type of real world situations that we all are going to face a lot more um, uh, in the years to come. Yeah, thank you, Otto. Ted, do you want to say something? Yeah. So there's on the two points. One, I want to just make a comment on that I think puts it a little bit into perspective. The layers, we don't, like the feedback flows, but you don't need to ask all the layers before you can act. You have the decisions are local, so you can also just act. So that's just something that sometimes people, you know, they see other layers and that's where they go because that's a hierarchical system that everybody has to play more than may I, but that's not the case. So the, the slowness, but there's one thing about that is, I guess, let's see, that's a little bit of advanced sociocracy, but, what I think about a lot is that people do, in fact, sometimes default to kind of checking with everybody and so on. And that's that slow and very kind of consensus vibe um, way of practicing sociocracy I'm also not a big fan of. So what I'm excited about is to have kind of the nested system of holding holding a strong, I guess, center but then having very agile and empowered teams more on the periphery and they prototype, they go do stuff, they try things out and they might yeah, have all these experiments. So, but that is a level of literacy that it takes for people to step into that game. That is, that is rather advanced given how we've, you know, how far away it is from people's, people's typically conditioning, typical conditioning. And on the on the um, on the other piece, I'm just completely with you. That's just the the um, yeah. In sociocracy, we basically just cross our fingers and say that you know that people are um, bold with with where they're going. That people um, do listen. And rounds is kind of a, a structural way of approaching it. But there's nothing I can do within sociocracy to get somebody out of out of for example their their thinking about preference about ego you know their thing this there's a little bit of an attempt in the structure and in the practice that you that you're nudged to think outside of that by being exposed but nothing more beyond that we're just crossing our fingers so that's i'm yes yeah, so that's clearly a place where i'm where i'm very curious about the connection check Hmm, thank you. Um, wow, I'd like to move into question. There's a lot of there's a lot of movement in me as I hear all these words, um, but I want to make space. Uh, we have also just for a few more minutes. So maybe I'll bring just one question and also you'll speak to that first and um, and then we'll um, we'll part. So I'll start with a question for Mark and thank you for all the questions that are coming in and we'll take what we can today and uh, there'll be more, I hope, for the future. So Mark question is both to Ted and Otto and is around, uh, I'll just read it, read the question, is SFA and well, so far and theory U process compatible with organizations where the leaders are still equipped with a strong ego mindset? If yes, how to proceed? Uh, and basically, there's another question that goes along the same line, how to bring ego-driven leaders into deeper sensing. So maybe, Otto, you want to uh, to speak to that so we can also th say thank you and let you go in, in the time. Well, 
uh, I would say theory U is is not the solution for all the problems you 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 face, right? So it's uh, in in all situations. I think kind of theory U is particularly um, uh, helpful. I would say when you deal with disruptions and dis disruptions uh, by definition are um, situations where the future is going to be different from the past. So um, and where we don't exactly know where where that is leading us. So so it's kind of it's in that territory where something like um, theory U, which helps us to organize around something that's emerging, is helpful. And I would say uh, that you know not all um, situations qualify for that, but just about as I said at the beginning. I mean, this kind of situation is not in short supply and it's multiplying uh, every other day. And um, so uh, it may not be everyone, but kind of uh, as the cracks in the old system that's beginning to collapse. But let's also not be kidding ourselves. The collapse is not over the day after tomorrow. Right. That can be a quite extended process. So as we see these cracks opening up, that's where the possibility is right because that's where the new awareness uh, has a door uh, that where it can can come in because uh, a crack means the old system is no longer producing the old way of operating is no longer producing the results that are acceptable for us so we need a stop we need a tent we need to connect to the situation differently and then come up with a different way of uh, operating. So that's where I would um, I would hold back on kind of um, trying to convince people that for who something else is still workable. I would go to those places where the old system is cracking and opening up, because that's where people need help and people are actually in search for uh, what can we do now. Thank you. Um, I just want to do a check. Also, it's it's um, an hour has passed, so I don't want. Uh, but I want to hear what Ted is. Uh, yeah, Ted's cool. Responses. Very good. Thank you. Oh, and I was so taken by the answer that I forgot the question. Wait. Um, Oh, what about people with strong ego yeah. mindset? Yeah, as I said, I mean, in a way, in a way, I mean, I've been, for example, I've been asked by people with a strong, with a strong mindset like that, that they basically wanted to introduce sociocracy so that other people are more productive. Um, and I stayed clear of that. It's, that's not something else needs to shift there first before before it's ready for that so that's where um that falls into the camp of there are not as many answers there i think that that sociocracy can bring because also there's the the problem that if then we implement because of that person somehow falling in love with sociocracy and having the idea that that's a great idea uh, if we then implement top down, that's really that's I'm skeptical of that. Um, again, that's something we talked about a little bit yesterday, right? And I'm still thinking about that because uh, there might it would be interesting to study the examples of where something was um, implemented top down and just to see what it did with the people who might like how many people come around or how much does it always remain at the mercy of the person who brought it in because if that's the case then then i'd be super skeptical of it because shared power can be at the mercy of somebody who implemented it that just does not mix for me so um and then it's a big question for example that for me becomes very practical of who approves the constitution so to speak right who puts the who who can change the rules of the game around governance so that's that's a very practical implication um if that was for example if for example that person that very ego driven leader were willing to share that power with others i'd be more open to to reconsidering that so that would be that would be an interesting situation yeah and i think i'll stop here 
So uh, I, I found this uh, conversation uh, really um, um, thought triggering and and um, uh, and and, and uh, opening. I mean, I'm I'm leaving with um, more questions that I enter with, and uh, that makes me happy. So because that that's a good path. And um, so I want one question. I want to leave you with. Um, since kind of, you know, I, I think kind of you and your community kind of you probably have thought a lot more about that is the levels of governance that we really need. And I think so implicitly, at least in my thinking, um, uh, the, the cases that we discussed were pretty small, right? It's kind of meso uh, type of maybe organizational or maybe kind of some of the example more sounded like a team or something like that. Um, but um, the, the big questions we are facing now are really kind of the whole systems question or the societal level or also kind of the global level. So, and I wonder, uh, I would be just interested in learning how your thinking has been evolving in, in, in regard to that. So, for example, you could say that the problem today we have in society is that we have different kind of sectors that each actually need kind of different type of uh, governance systems. So, for example, you have the world of business kind of that's kind of one set of problems you have kind of the more political uh, space of decision making and, and sense making. And then you have the more cultural spaces with a lot of diverse, diverse kind of initiatives and so on. So is that all the same or, or so what are the so there is like institutional governance, but what about the macro uh, societal uh, governance structures? So how does that play in? That would be just a fascinating conversation to have because sometimes um, so if, if we don't uh, often kind of the practical examples stay on an organizational level when the real issues really are more on a, on a systems level that, that needed to be addressed to get to the root of things. So that's just kind of my parting thought. And uh, I really appreciate the conversational space here and um, look forward to uh, uh, maybe uh, continuing this in, in some other version going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Otto, for joining us today and speaking. And there's so much inspiration. I've learned and I'm just full. My mind and my body is exploding with questions and investigations. Uh, so thank you. Um, and we'll let you go. And we'll stay on for um, some more triads. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Otto. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Welcome back, everybody. Um, well, with the remaining time, we, we're going to just hear from Pascal about the project. There are some questions around that. And then we'll just take some questions, some sharing. Um, just raise your hand if you feel that you want to share something with us. And at the meantime, Pascal, do you want to speak about the project? Uh, yeah, sure. Just very quickly, because we're actually uh, planning on publishing. So there will be an article that explains the uh, the project better and in a more detailed way, but just saying, like we were saying, composites are composite approaches are necessary, and the skill is to know when you should be going to this kind of methodology or using this approach at different moments. So that's the whole skill, and the project is about uh, we're we're working with other creators and paradigm shifting professionals on a concept that's called transformative social systems. And the idea behind that is catching the low hanging fruit that's out there in the commons so that we can build powerful learning and development spaces that include the elements. Uh, for example, things that would help us work on energy when we need to, on our attention, on observation skills, on inclusion, listening, reflection, uh, working on intention, uh, decision making, getting feedback. So these are things that we see in many of these um, um, technologies that are out there and the transformative social system that we call the TSS project is to see how we can grab things and um, help people master different uh, approaches so that they can uh, organize and facilitate communities 
around them. Mm. Thank you, Edith, for the possibility to explain. Thanks. Yeah, important. Um, okay, Randy, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. I, 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 the common theme of the three of us in our breakout group was around power. And, and I brought up this amazing YouTube I had just watched by a woman named Carolyn Miss, M-Y-S-S. -S. And, 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 it, it, and it's moving from the love of power to the power of love. And I think that Otto, you know, I, what I always resonate so much with in Theory U is his talking about the heart space and how much more we have to beginning to imagine what, what love is. And I, I thought her, her, her talk was really inspirational for me a few weeks ago. And then, it, and then this beautiful book that I just got the other day, Humankind, <laughs> chapter 11 is on um, the abuses of power. I've never seen something more succinctly stated. And I think that it really gets at that issue of that I've been flummoxed by forever about how do you change organizations when, when you have a bunch of, of non-aware egotistical leaders, you know, and, and that's what basically reinventing organizations was about is it only works in organizations where people have move beyond and he auto says that too moving beyond the ego but we really have to begin to unpack that and power is a big part of that that's a, so that's kind of a ramble there thanks for letting me share that thank you yeah ted do you want to say anything to that at all well what i took away from humankind actually in reading i it threw me into a several week depression reading the book because one of the and i loved it at the same time one of the things that I took from it, but again, I have a super strong governance lens, right, is that he's saying that people are good a lot of, you know, we all wake up in the morning typically and want to be a good person to other people. Like that's, that's what we do. And then what, and then I had this moment of like, wait, but if everybody is actually good, then all the, all the explanations, you know, that some people are like, all the all the blame um blaming and passing of of blame just falls flat and then it's about the systems right then it's about the systems that people are in whether the systems are such that they can um tap into that sort of true self if we want if we want to use that right or whether things are stacked against them and they can show up as that so to me it's it's really pointing at systems so much so that's why um yeah that's why i go back to always awareness based and systems based it needs to come together that's yeah we are already good people we don't need to be reminded as much because i already believe that we're good so that combination i think is that edge that we're all on here today yeah, and for me, maybe to add, Randy, as I hear you speak, that I, th I think that the first step is is how do we look at our own relationship to our own power and to power? And I think as we unpack our own relationship to power, um, then other things may come up and the future can be can start to, to come up as a new future uh, rather than tr try and fix something uh, to really look at what is my relationship to power, uh, my hurt, my absence, my uh, wishes, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, thank you for this beautiful question. And, and I, would, I would inject one thing, though, that, it, that it's one thing that we're all good people, but we don't realize our degree of wounding. And the second part of our conversation in our group, and, and T was so articulate in that, is all of the work that's being done with trauma and like, it's like we all need recovery programs and maybe workplaces are places where cohorts of people can heal together. And that should be part of the, you know, the, the, a new image of, of, of growth and possibility. So. Yeah, a bit like Pascal's project. It sounds like, you know, when do we bring what, uh, what is needed um, and we all need to heal and um, and yeah and, and maybe 
sort of to to come to a close where you know the the sentence that Otto starts with you know we cannot bring change to a system without changing our levels of consciousness he didn't say it quite like this but um I, th I think it really speaks and and also sociocracy in many ways is is another level we require to grow our level of consciousness to grow a level of responsibility of self-responsibility of how we respond and how we show up so for me they're very connected also there um we're coming to an end um so i just want maybe a few words from ted and from pascal and um then we'll also put links on the in the chat um about sofa about theory you uh pascal had uh, created a beautiful presentation already talking about theory you and sociocracy and we'll put that also in the chat and i really um, invite you all to take the time to listen to it it's not very long but it's very potent and um, very good um, as well as if you want to prescribe to SOFA newsletter if you'd like to donate and support our work in SOFA please uh, you're very welcome um, did I forget anything no no mm -hmm. So Pascal, maybe you want to say a few words to end with, um, and then we'll go to Ted. Uh, yes, thank you, Edith. Um, I actually am leaving with, an, I, I just downloaded the chat because there are too many beautiful questions in that chat, and I want to add them to all the questions that are turning uh, here in my mind now. I think it was a very thought-provoking moment for me. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Um, I hope everyone in the in their breakout rooms was also able to exchange a bit because it was a bit the round table mostly and we didn't get many questions and answers in but um, that space also I think is important for that. Thank you so much for inviting me I'm really, really thankful to have been included in this event. Check. Thank you. My closing thoughts as well i mean i really i really take note of the kind of advice or questions from the outside um so i'm i'm very grateful for all the questioning that has happened um some of which were kind of in the oh yeah i've already heard that one camp but others were like yeah right are we clear about that or what what do yeah just so many so many um points that one can um explore more and understand more and say more so um yeah just grateful overall check yes and thank you everybody for joining us thank you thomas for taking care um of our meeting today and uh being really our technical host here and for all the questions and so on and yeah, I'm I'm living with a lot of optimism. I feel that these conversations need to happen more often uh, as we're changing ideas and speaking and growing ourselves to include more and more of everything else that is so good already in our world and happening. Um, and I think that this is really is, is our way forward um as we create safety to listen to learn how we work well together and how we show up in the world so really thank you everybody for joining us today and we'll get all the questions and hopefully we'll um, do something with them and find ways follow us there's many webinars uh still coming up in in sofa so keep following us thank you so much everybody and goodbye Bye, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks and bye. Bye 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 b